Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, here we are with Caleb Campbell. I am so excited to talk with Caleb about his journey from achieving his dream and goals of becoming an NFL player to what I'm going to label as a seeker, just like the title mm. of the show, Soul Seeker, which for a lot of us comes to it being a journey of acceptance. Before we dive into it, let's all just drop into some breath. So if you're driving, feel free to breathe with us, but of course, don't close your eyes or anything else. Caleb, for you and I, we can close our eyes and listeners, if you're in a place Place to just settle in, I invite you to slow down, find a seat, feeling your feet on the floor, and through the nose, inhaling all the way up, and through the mouth, exhale, through the nose as slow as you can, letting the belly expand and bringing that breath all the way up, sipping in a bit more. More air at the top, rolling back the eyes, hold the breath, audible sigh, let it go. <sighs> and one last one, biggest inhale yet, sipping in a bit more at the top, sipping a bit more, roll back the eyes, hold the breath, and sighing it out. the breath return to its natural state and rhythm and flickering the eyes back open caleb so awesome to connect with you how are you feeling brother i'm feeling great before we get started i have done so much breath work in my life but what is i've never heard somebody say roll back the eyes mm. Yeah, that's a kundalini thing that i picked oh, okay. up Maybe not kundalini but definitely meditation what I think about a lot in terms, thank you for asking, by the mm -hmm. way. And I, I love talking about this. I, I'm getting so into Kundalini. Do you know much mm -hmm. about it? No, just the name. So, yeah, yeah. I like totally. the way it rolls off my tongue. Kundalini. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. Kundalini. So like the legend is that Shakti, or we could think of the goddess Shakti mm -hmm. as Kali sitting dormant at the root chakra, the first energy center. And when she wakes up to like her I amness, mm -hmm. actually it's the opposite. Um, Shiva, her lover wakes up to his I, am I amness at the third eye. Then Shakti is trying to make her way up from the root to the third eye. So mm -hmm. she's burning out all the distortions the blockages the impurities of the lower three chakras activating the heart and getting straight up to her lover which i think is just a beautiful story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then when we're doing breath work or even like a alternate nostril breathing what we're mm -hmm. doing is uh balancing the masculine mm -hmm. feminine energy centers for that those pathways to come up through the nadis which are similar to like meridians so rolling back the eyes is just like a focus of activating the third eye and i mm. think so often as well especially for a lot of people i work with when we're newer to meditation i find this with myself a lot a lot of times when i'm meditating or even doing breath work my awareness is at least like three feet in front of me 
So when I cue rolling back the eyes, not only is he a focus of like getting that energy to rise mm. up and activate the third eye, but also helps to like focus on that space right in yeah. front of you versus outwardly, you know? Yeah. Beautiful explanation. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, brother. Thanks for asking. So yeah. thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to connect with you. You know, every now and then there's people that you come across where you just see yourself in them and you're like, wow, like you're, t you're saying the same things that I'm feeling and that I say, but I've never come across you before. And we got here in different ways and we're <laughs> saying it differently, but like, it's that same frequency. Mm. So I'd love for the listeners just to hear a little bit about who you are, your journey with football and where you're at now. Yeah. Um, I, I also, get excited when you come across people you're like oh my people <laughs> um so yeah i get it um so yeah this is always such a, a big big question um but you know i was i was seven years old i remember i scored a i grew up in texas so you better believe uh football was a big deal right i think honestly right. the only thing that might have been a bigger deal than uh playing football as a young boy in the panhandle of Texas, as if you were cast to play Jesus in the annual school Christmas play. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, I, I, I remember uh, when I was about seven years old, I, I, I honestly remember this like it was yesterday. Score the game winning touchdown in the community wide all star championship game. And I remember I, I looked to the sideline and I was scanning the sideline trying to find my biggest fan is my mom, as you might imagine. Um, and when my eyes locked my mom's eyes, I remember running as fast as my tired legs could run. And when I got to her, she bent over. She had this really big smile on her face and she was so excited. And she said such with such, you know, enthusiasm. She said, son, you scored the game winning touchdown. You know, like she was just so excited and had this big smile on my face. And then she said, I love you so much. And I, I'm telling you that story because, you know, I knew something happened to me in that moment, but I wouldn't really understand it until decades later. But I, I tell that story because I was really seven years old when I was taught to believe that my performance in life determines my, my level of acceptance and love in this world, especially from my primary caretaker, my mother. Um, and this experience, it was reinforced throughout my entire young adult life. You know, performance determines acceptance, performance determines acceptance. And so suddenly at this time in my life, you know, a deep fear began to emerge on the scene of my heart. And it's a very familiar fear. And it was the fear of not being enough because suddenly my stats were no longer just numbers on a piece of paper. They were definitions of my worth. Mm -hmm. But this fear, as we all know, fear is an incredible motivator. Like the fear of not being enough is one hell of a motivator. Like it will, it will wake you up before anybody else is up and it will keep you working at night before, you know, long after everyone else falls asleep. And this fear has served me well. And it really fueled this newfound performance driven mindset. Um, and that mindset has served me well. Like this fear has served me well. I went from you know scoring touchdowns in the community all-star championship game to being inducted into the Texas High School Football Hall of Fame. Um, I got the a Division One college football scholarship to play at the United States Military Academy at West Point. My freshman year, I was all conference. My sophomore year, I uh, had a breakout season. I was one of the top collegiate football players in my position across all of college football. Mm -hmm. My junior year, I had the honor of putting a, a C on my uniform, which stood for captain. Mm -hmm. And then my senior year, you know, I, I find myself arguably where every football player dreams about being at some point in time in their career. And that's in the iconic Radio City Music Hall in New York City, where I was surrounded by 10,000 screaming fans chanting my name and also 36 mm -hmm. million people watching from home. You know, as uh, the commissioner of the NFL, Roger Goodell, he walked to a podium to announce to me, the screaming fans and everyone else watching that the Detroit Lions had just selected me in the NFL draft making me actually the second player out of the history of West Point to ever get selected in the NFL draft and the first one ever given the permission to play and serve simultaneously, which actually became a, a very big controversy um, just because, you know, if you're familiar with West Point, when you graduate the academy, you're commissioned as an officer in the United States Army, and you have a minimum of a five-year service obligation. And so, as you might imagine, when I was drafted, there was a lot of mixed emotion as I also graduated the academy with 972 other cadets. And the difference between me and them is they were all sent to war and I was making my way to the NFL. What year was this? Back in 2008. Got it. And I remember shortly after getting drafted, I was on a national television doing an interview with a ESPN host at the time, Trey Wingo. And uh, he looked at me and he said, Caleb, I need you to know you're not just another athlete. He said, you're America's athlete. 
you're a West Point graduate, you're an army officer, and now you're an NFL draft pick. Yeah. And I know that Trey meant well when he said that, but my God, I heard nothing good in that comment. What I heard is Caleb, don't fuck this up. Caleb, don't be weak. Caleb, have it together all the time. Like, let's go. That's what I heard. And so in this moment, you know, there was this heaviness of pressures and expectations that just really suffocated the joy right out of this experience. And I, I made my way into the NFL and I had all of these expectations um, that I had for myself and also that a lot of people had for me. And I told myself like my unique way of giving back, like my way of serving our country, because when I was in the NFL, like I'm telling you hundreds, hundreds of messages. And, you know, I had flags sent to me from downrange that were, you know, used by people with the boots on the ground, walking into, um, you know, uh, like they were carrying these flags in combat and they send them to me and the whole unit signed them and just saying like, we're rooting for you. We're, we're believing in you. Like, don't let us down. Wow. And so there's just all of this pressure. And I also put all this pressure on myself because again, my way of giving back would be my performance in the NFL. But when I get to the NFL, the NFL is just this, it's an ecosystem that applied just enough pressure to this deeply, deeply wounded heart that, you know, since I was seven years old, I was afraid of allowing somebody to see the real me because if they saw the real me, then they would see that I'm not enough, that I'm not who you think that I am. And obviously that just intensified over the years. And now I'm in this place being called America's athlete, but feeling like such an imposter, such a fraud. And I'm, I'm in the NFL and I'm, you know, I played better football when I was seven years old in that community all-star championship game. Uh, and I knew it was just a matter of time before the whole world would see that I'm not America's athlete, that, you know, everybody would see that I'm not who they think that I am, that I don't have what it takes. And, and the whole, and I would be cut essentially. Like I knew like before my NFL career was ever going to start, I was going to be released. And so I'm, I'm, you know, getting ready to start my first NFL career and all this internal pressure is building, building, building. I'm coming undone, but doing everything I can using all of my energies, just trying to hold it all together, hold together this idea of a man that I thought I was supposed to be. And I thought that people expected me to be, and really just hold together this dream that I had to just keep alive. But then the most unprecedented thing happened. I don't know if you know this, but like on the literally hours before I was scheduled to sign my first NFL contract and start my first NFL season, my agent called me and said, Caleb, something's going on. You've got to get to the stadium immediately. So I got to the stadium. They you know, directed me to a team meeting room up on the second floor of the Detroit Lions headquarters. And as I walked in, anybody, I, I quickly saw that anybody that was somebody <laughs> in the Detroit Lions organization was there from the head coach to the president of the organization. And they were all sitting at this black conference table huddled around this uh, black conference phone. And as I walked and sat at the table, there was a voice that emerged on the other side of the phone. And it was a uh, the voice that belonged to a government official, a department of defense government official. And he said, Caleb, I want to let you know that we're sorry to tell you, but the policy that was allowing you to play and serve simultaneously that went into effect my sophomore year at the academy, it no longer exists. You are hereby ordered to return back to active duty immediately. And after serving your country for two years, if you can get a new NFL contract, you know, then you can make your way back to the NFL. Like, I don't know if, know if y'all know this, but like getting an NFL contract, is kind of challenging. <laughs> But the crazy thing is, Sam, is like in this moment when my dream is just pulled out from underneath me, like I, I've never been so excited. I was actually thrilled because in my head, I kind of just got a get out of jail free card. Like I'm going to have two years to keep this dream alive. So I got two years essentially to get bigger, faster, and stronger so that I can make sure if I do get the opportunity to come back to the NFL, I'll be ready. I will have outworked this internal chaos that I'm experiencing. And on top of that, nobody actually has to see how much of a fraud that I feel. So I went PT sessions with my unit. I had military training in the morning. I had classroom work in the afternoon. And then when everybody else went home for the day, I made my way back to the gym and I put in the work so that if I did get a new opportunity two years later, I would be ready. And two years later, I found myself the biggest, the fastest, the strongest I've ever been. And getting offered a new NFL contract and running out on my first NFL field and playing in my first NFL game and, you know, ultimately achieving a childhood dream that I had since I was just seven years old, really making an impossible dream possible. And I'll never forget that first moment 
of running out onto my first NFL field and my first NFL practice, as soon as I hit that field, I had a, oh, fuck moment because I knew that despite being the biggest and the fastest and the strongest I've ever been, despite being ready to play in the NFL, that fear that I had felt two years earlier, a fear of exposed, a fear of being exposed, a fear of not being enough, the fear of not having what it takes to being seen as a fraud, it didn't go away. It actually grew stronger. <laughs> and when I ran out on the NFL field, there was just such a deep knowing that there was no amount of external work that I could do that would actually resolve this internal war that I was experiencing. So I spent the next three seasons in the NFL, the three years in the NFL, kind of doing my best to hold it all together, to perfect this image and this facade, not allowing other people to see the real me, but not come fully undone. And as each day passed, it felt like my life had just become more of a pressure cooker. And I started, you know, I'm in the middle of my childhood dream and I'm, (laughs) I'm putting more things up my nose than you can probably imagine just trying to cope with the pain, Mm -hmm. drinking obsessively, you know, tons of sex, tons of booze, tons of drugs, just, just coping with the pain. I think a part of me wanted to get found out. Like I wanted to get busted. Like I wanted to get caught. So like this madness could stop because I didn't have the courage to walk away. You know, walking away felt like the ultimate death sentence because it wasn't just football anymore. The, you know, the game was the oxygen in my lungs and the blood in my veins. It was so much more deeper than just a game. And I kind of got to the point at the end of the three seasons where I remember waking up one night from a party and just having a really moment of realizing that, fuck, if something doesn't change and change soon, man, it's only a matter of time before my parents get a, a phone call notifying them that their son is no longer with them. And I knew that after I got released from the Kansas city chiefs, that my, my days playing football were over. I was going to have to hang up my cleats and there was something in me that knew you, you, you said seeker earlier. You know, I I remember uh, when I walked away from the NFL, I found myself back in my childhood home (laughs) in my childhood town, say like that. And I was at my dad's house. He had a new house from what we grew up in, but I was in in the Texas panhandle. And I remember, man, I was the least self-aware person at the time in my life. So you just gotta, you know, listen to this through that lens, like the least self-aware person, but I remember sitting on my dad's front porch and there was a, a thunderstorm rolling in like true story. And the Texas panhandle sky, you can see it for as long as you can look, right. It's just, it goes endlessly and the sun was setting, but then there was this dark cloud, just really swallowing any sort of sunset alive and just to a hole of darkness. And as I was sitting there watching that storm roll in, there was something that in me that just knew that this storm, it wasn't just a storm that was rolling through the Texas panhandle, but it was a prophecy for my life and for what's to come. Like I knew that I knew that I knew that the way that I had done life up until this point, it was over. It was done. And I also knew, you know, despite being offered a lot of different job opportunities because West Point graduates, we take care of our own. And my story had so much high visibility that a lot of people reached out and offered me great, amazing jobs. And I just knew that that was not my path. There was something in me and also simultaneously outside of me that was like pulling me forward, asking me to say yes to this journey of discovering something beyond titles and achievements and accolades. Because I got to the NFL, I, I reached this, this version of life that I told myself for as long as I can remember, if I can just get there, if I can just get there, then I would satisfy this deepest ache, this longing in my heart. And I realized it's not true, actually. Like I'm, I'm playing a losing game. Not only will the go post continuously move 10 more yards down the field, but the, I cannot discover outside of myself what I'm meant to discover only within myself. And so standing on my dad's front porch, I'm telling you such a long ass story. I apologize. No, it's great. I love it. Thank you. And I just knew that it was time. It was time to follow this invitation from my soul, you know, looking back, it's clear to me what's happening. If you, you know, you're familiar with Joseph Campbell, it's the call for spiritual adventure. There's always a crisis and there's always an invitation and there sure as hell was a crisis. And I felt the invitation in my, it doesn't make logical sense. And that's how, you know, that's your soul calling because you can't 
deny what you're feeling, but then you try to intellectualize and understand what's happening in your head. And it just doesn't compute. It doesn't make any sense on paper, but there's almost like you can't ignore it. And so I said yes to it. And to fast forward, you know, I moved, I went from playing in front of 80,000 people to moving to Canada where I became a, a janitor of an organization. I slept on a basement floor of a boiler room for the next five years of my life. And every day I woke up, I cleaned toilets, I washed windows, I vacuumed floors, and I changed light bulbs. And I did it in exchange for basically inner child healing. I started to mm-hmm. really learn how to grieve all of the parts of me that I lost along the way of trying to become bigger, faster, and stronger so that I could find my unique place of belonging and love and acceptance in this very cold hearted proven world. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, I started to heal and my life changed in some of the most unimaginable ways. And I'm very much still living obviously on that journey, as you know, it never ends, but that is uh, ultimately kind of how I landed in in terms of what I'm doing now as a full-time keynote speaker, working with, uh, you know, organizations around well-being. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. That was the longest ever intro. I usually, I usually uh, really scan over that quickly, but here we are. I appreciate you listening. Hopefully your listeners are still with us. (laughs) You know, I love it. The origin stories a lot of times, uh, and I don't even know what episode this is. I think it's 224. Uh, I already labeled it, whatever. It's over 200, right? And I'd say like the first 50, maybe 75 of these episodes, a lot of them were just origin stories, just going mm-hmm. deep and in. It's kind of trans, transformed and morphed, and but it's always nice to do a deep dive and yeah. really hear people's stories. And when I hear you speak, I think of like Captain America, you know, yeah. like America's athlete, you know, right? And West yeah. Point and all the things and being from Texas, right? In Detroit, like even that, that's mm-hmm. very blue collar as well. So going from that to moving to Canada and mm-hmm. becoming a janitor in exchange for or inner child healing. Like, I know you kind of glossed over that, but this mm-hmm. is one of the most challenging parts in terms of answering the call, going back mm-hmm. to Joseph Campbell's mm-hmm. uh, model. What did that look like? Like how, why Canada? What was this place? Like yeah. how did that unfold? <laughs> um, I like, no joke. I was, I was in my aunt's basement I had just opened maybe my third or maybe fourth bottle of wine. Um, I was scrolling through Twitter, feeling so lost, so misunderstood. I, again, nobody, nobody had ever given me the language to understand the deeper narrative that was, that was happening within me. And I was scrolling through Twitter and honestly, it was a church that had put language to essentially there is no new life without first a metaphorical death, that concept. And my God, for the first time in my life, I was like, that's what's happening to me. I'm dying. Like that's what's happening. And I wanted new life more than anything else. And I kept trying to resuscitate this old way of life and trying to hope that it would emerge into something new. And it just left me feeling so, helpless and hopeless and that despair it was just becoming heavier by the day and it was leaving me not just with the tired eyes but like a tired soul and so when they put language to that i felt so seen and there was something in me despite having like you know three bottles of vino in me i was like my heart felt like it was just resuscitated in that moment like it just came back online felt like I sobered up and there was something that in me that just knew, like, I don't know who the hell these people are, but I'm going to go find out. Within two days, I had packed my car, anything that didn't fit in my car, I had sold or put into storage. And I drove to Canada, Hmm. crossed the border, had a long chit chat on what I was allowed not to do and what I could do with the border agent. Drove into uh, Canada, got into this church, walked into this organization. I'm just like, hey, y'all don't know me. And this is going to sound nuts, but I feel like here's my story. I'm supposed to be here. Can you help me? And they're like, welcome home, Caleb. And it was this beautiful experience because it got very convoluted later, but I grew up in the Texas panhandle. So I grew up in the Bible Belt. I grew up very evangelical. And so a big part of my healing story, actually, it kind of like returned me back to my beginnings and, 
what this like putting me back in a church i feel like was so specific and it was so necessary because so much of my wounding was like this anger i carried towards source or towards god like i was just so mad because there were so many of these like childhood prophecies spoken over my life about football and like bigness and you know growing up in the evangelical bible belt of texas like you can't go very far without having somebody telling you, well, God has great big plans for you, son. And I heard that my entire life, big plans. And then I get to the ultimate, you know, top of the big plan that has been prophesied over my life since I was just a young boy and I fucking fall flat on my face. And so there's just so much grief and anger that like you abandoned me. And so going back into the church, it was so necessary because I felt like there's a direct correlation between my healing and also the healing and the forgiveness and the re letting go and the surrendering and the grieving that took place around my idea of God. But then there came the moment where like my healing journey, it brought me to this moment of realizing that my idea of God is so fucking small. Mm -hmm. Like all of these little pretty little boxes that I put God in that I was taught to put in God. As I began to have this inner spaciousness within me open up for my healing work, suddenly God looks so much bigger than what I was taught to believe or what the church was telling me was God. And there, I became kind of at odds with this church. And I, I knew that like, Oh, there's my soul again, whispering to me, it's time to go. And so I walked away from that. And then that's when I moved to Los Angeles, but that time in church, it honestly was this beautiful ecosystem where I could start really like, they didn't give a shit who I was. They didn't, I mean, they're Canadians. Um, so they didn't, they didn't care about, American football. And they just, they didn't care about all the titles and all the facades. They didn't, they didn't see me as America's athlete. They saw me just as this little wounded boy in a very big man's body. And so it was this beautiful ecosystem where I felt like for the first time I could start to peel back the layers and allow somebody to really see me and starting to stand in that stark vulnerability of that nakedness, that rawness and allowing a gaze of another person just to mm -hmm. really behold me and allowing me to be seen in that place. It did something to me. It, it really helped me hone in on finding belonging in my innate beingness. And that was very, very transformative for me. And then there were, you know, like some, a lot of somatic and um, CBT, um, learning how to really become the observer of my thought life. Uh, just a lot of work started to take place. Um, and I think it set the real foundation uh, for the next several years that I was getting ready to live into. That's incredible. And was there a specific experience that brought you to that memory being seven years old with the the story that became ingrained of your psyche mm -hmm. of, of performance determines acceptance mm. um was there something that happened that brought me back to that yeah like how did that get uncovered that actually got uncovered um through uh like uh uh experiential like play therapy oh, okay yeah uh, um i was like acting out um i was at a trauma-informed center acting out like the parts of me in my childhood that I felt like got suffocated early on. And that just came out where I scored this touchdown and I see this moment. And then suddenly like my mother, like I love her dearly. And I've talked so publicly about this, but in this moment, she was my prior primary caretaker, but she was also living so vicariously through me that my life became her life real quick. And so there was, there was no, after this moment, she saw just, she saw the potential in me. There was no, more room to be a kid. Like I was, I was up at five 30 in the morning in middle school, running sprints out on the Texas panhandle plains of, you know, sheer farm farmland. My mom had me out there just running sprints and like, you know, telling me every day that I'm going to mount to something bigger than, you know, what anybody has ever expected. And so like that became so big for me and I wanted to live into that vision, but you know, there was so much enmeshment there. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm rambling, but uh, that was a big part of the healing journey, but it came through some play therapy actually, which is fucking hard for me. <laughs> yeah. I won't get into that. Have you seen the movie, uh, iron claw, which is about the wrestlers mm -mm. and dad driving is, yeah, his... I wanted to, 
Yeah, for yeah. all the listeners, incredible movie. And I, I actually got in conversation with a buddy who played uh, collegiate sports. Very and cool. He was, he was like, that movie was so depressing. And I'm like, it was? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I guess you're right. Yeah, it was. Wow, that's weird. Like, yeah, I guess I do like depressing movies. And hmm, let me look into that why. But yeah, I think there's a lot of <laughs> lessons that we can learn from it. And the reason why I bring that up is like, this is very making a generalization, but usually it's the the dad, the father yeah, that's driving yeah. the kid, you know? Mm -hmm. That was also that's like so much work I've had to uncover is like, it's so funny because if you look at my dating pattern before I found my wife, um, who I would easily say is my soulmate, whether you believe in that or not, like I falling in love with my wife and doing doing life with my wife, my partner, Kara, is the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. It's just like seamless. Like this, is, I just remember having this experience when we, when our paths collided, I was like, fuck, this was waiting for me all along. Like it was just the easiest thing I've ever done. And we're still, you know, she's my best friend and we have this beautiful life and it's so much fun, but um, shit, I just totally lost. Uh, why were, what was I saying? Connection that? Mom, maybe. Ah, I just totally lost my train of thought. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll come back to it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just totally lost my shirt. This this football brain for you. <laughs> no, it's all of us. It totally yeah. happens for sure. You know, men's work. You into yeah. men's work a little bit, a lot of bit, or just like. What do you mean by that? It, well, it's interesting because I know from I was never an athlete. I was surrounded around a lot of athletes and like top fraternity at college, living above the most popular bar and like, uh, you know, a lot of alphas for sure. Yeah. And I, my buddies always kind of joked like because I was more of like a high school metalhead stoner and just depressed and angry and whatever else. So I didn't do like the whole sports thing. Sure. You know, but like I, I kind of like tapped into who I really am versus just being so depressed mm. at the way society is run and not having the tools to, to mm. deal with that as a little kid. But the reason why I go here is I've always had a very tough exterior mm. and it's been even not being like a football player jock or anything like that. It's been a massive journey for me to really like lean into the soft edges. And especially sure, beautiful. when I was new um, on the like path of spirituality, like I had to call myself the first year or two of being on the path. I had to call myself a recovering, recovering bro to like <laughs> justify like where I was at and be like, no, 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 like I'm not soft, you know, like I was a bro, but now I'm like in recovery mm -hmm. I'm recovering, bro. Like what's the journey been like for you to kind mm -hmm. of be like open and honest with your emotions, mm -hmm. not just with yourself, but externally and be seen that way. Mm -hmm. You're not, I don't know if you'll like this answer or not. Um, I would say that's who I am naturally. Mm -hmm. I was a very empathetic, soft, compassionate, tender boy. And I talked about my feelings often until I was taught to pray them away. And so coming back to that through my healing journey, I felt like, it was who I've been all along. And so I would say that like my vulnerability naturally, like my willingness to allow another person to see me when I remember in Canada, when I tasted the freedom that came in that moment of realizing that the deep acceptance that I long to experience in this world is directly correlated to my ability and willingness to allow another person to see beyond the facades, to see the real me. When I tasted the freedom of that, it was like the most addicting drug ever. Like I want more of this freedom. And I honestly have always shied away from men's group, men's work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a beautiful space for the right people. Like, I think it's beautiful. Some of the work that it's doing, but most of the men's work that I came, this is me being so fucking judgmental because most of the men's work I come across are the men's group. You know, they've got big beers and they like, we're going to fucking smoke cigars and we're going to talk about our feelings. And it's almost like, it feels like this forced vulnerability mm -hmm. um, or this performances, performances on inside of vulnerability. And again, that's me being so judgmental and, I know there's so many beautiful, like Connor B and man talks does beautiful work with men. Um, and so many other leaders doing beautiful work with men. I just had never, I never felt like it just like, I didn't, I didn't even know that was a thing until I moved out into LA and it just never fit. 
Um, and so this, for me, I feel like just through my own path and on my own journey, um, it was the natural evolution of my growth. And that is just being so much more in tune with what I'm feeling, speaking about what I'm feeling, allowing people to see the real me. Um, and I think I had the privilege, Sam, of like getting to the top and realizing it's fucking rigged. Like it's a losing mm-hmm. game. And so there was something that in me that knew that I just didn't want to continue down that path in just a different avenue. Like I didn't want to materialize that in just a new way. And so I knew what was being asked of me as this invitation was being extended, this soul descent invitation. I just knew it was going to require me to show up in a completely radically different way. And I, above all else, just had a full hearted yes whatever it takes, whatever it costs. I want that. I imagine though, on your, your climb to the top, like there was a, like probably was hard for you to fully feel what was coming to the surface. Cause you probably got so much. Yeah. That's more what I was getting at. So sorry. Yeah. I was a fucking mess. I was, I was a rage filled alcoholic that, yeah, I've put my fist through more. I can't remember that quote, you know, so many times I see men wanting to weep, but instead they beat their chest over and over and over again. Such like a that, good way to put it. Yeah. that was me, you know, like you would not see me weep. You will not see me cry. You will not see any sort of weakness. And that was like, so I definitely, um, I, my anger, I remember I was at West Point. I had a long story short, I had a complete breakdown as a freshman at West Point and they had instructed me to go see my first therapist. And as I walked into that meeting with this therapist, I explained to him what I was feeling. And he said, Caleb, I'm going to ask you a question. I don't want you to like get alarmed, but I want to ask you a question. Has somebody ever talked to you about depression? And I was like, what? And he was like, you're uh, some like, you know, basically saying you're a very high functioning, but depressed person. Like, these people exist. And what you're explaining to me is exactly how we would classify this. And he wrote me a script for meds and I have nothing against meds. I've taken them in times of my life. And I remember when he handed me that script, the only question that I had for him, the only question was, I said, I looked at him straight in the eyes and I said, will these meds take away my rage? Because if they do, I don't want them. Because my rage was like my, my way of protecting myself. Anytime I felt vulnerable, anytime I felt exposed or about to be exposed, my rage would come online and it would allow me to regain control over the vulnerability of a moment that I found myself in. And that, as you can imagine, created a lot of chaos in my life. Yeah. So <laughs> what do you say then? Uh, he looked at me stunned. He was genuinely shocked. Mm -hmm. And he just didn't understand, like, wait, don't you want that? And I was like, no. And I took those meds. We had to pick them up. I had them get them the script filled um, because they check. But then I dumped them all down the toilet. Mm. And now that you're on this path, like, what's your relationship to rage? Or what what kind of work did you need to lean into to Mm. even rebuild your relationship with rage? Grief. Mm, Yeah, talk with us about grief work. I feel like grief work, you know, as Francis Weller, who's one of my favorite teachers, you probably saw that quote that I, I posted on my Instagram mm-hmm. a while ago, but his work around grief has just transformed my life. Um, you know, grief is what transmutes our pain and our suffering into a seed and then plants that seed into fertile soil so that we can bloom new life, essentially. I just realized that all of the times in my life where anger came out sideways, it really was an indication of just unprocessed grief that I was carrying. And that's not grief over like the loss of a loved one, but it's the grief of me not showing up the way I hoped I'd show up, me not meeting the expectations that people had of me, me not, you know, you know, living into the fullness of what I thought was my potential, all of this unmet expectations and unfulfilled dreams and things not going the way I expected them to go. And just being angry about that, but bearing that anger and doubling down, on my willful efforts to do better, to run faster, to try harder the next time, like that grief, it just gets buried in our bones. And then it just, at some point, 
it just comes out sideways. And so learning how to create the space to grieve all of the ideas and the unmet expectations of who I thought I was going to be, the person that I thought I was going to be, the life that I thought I was going to have, all of the unfulfilled dreams, all of the failures and the mistakes, being able to just feel those fully and to allow those, you know, to really move through me that has directly correlated into anger no longer being like on the table of my life, right? It's just not only that, but I feel like all of that grief, when you look at yourself as an individual, like we all have a tolerance level of how much like capacity we can hold. And that grief is fucking heavy and it takes up a lot of our mental and our emotional capacity. And so I often say like, when people are trying to find their soulmate, when people are trying to find the love of their life, when people are trying to find that dream job and they want that thing that they just so desperately want, like that's beautiful. Like your longing is so important. Listen to it, lean into it. But do you have space for it? Mm -hmm. like, genuinely, do you have space for it? Like, do you have the capacity? Because if you don't have the capacity, here's what you have to understand. Soul knows this so well like the deeper part of you that you're not yes necessarily in tune with knows this already, the weight of the thing that you want on a heart that doesn't have capacity will become the very thing that fractures you. Mm -hmm. Like the weight of success on a fractured heart only increases the fracture. I, I so, think I'm, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, you're just about to say, and so, so. <laughs> well, oh, no, it's fine. There. I just think like, it, like part of this work is the grief work is so, so, so important. Um, because it, 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 it's what allows you to create that internal spaciousness needed to invite in the thing that you want the most so that that very thing, the heaviness of it, the weight of it, it doesn't become the very thing that fractures you. Yeah. And what's coming up for me is uh, self-sabotage. And one of the clips I saw Absolutely. you put out was talking about how, I forget exactly what it was. I think you, you had a big day in sales. It was like oh, yeah. than the year previous. And you're like, and this is, this is the journey of self-discovery, remembering acceptance and being a seeker, whatever you want to say, that being on this path, but it's awareness. And mm -hmm. I am so right there with you. Like, it's something that I'm working on with myself right now. Like, how do I celebrate my wins? You know, back mm. in the day when I was not living mindfully, you know, it was hard enough to even stop and pause and celebrate. Mm. I remember an ex being like, let's celebrate. And I'm like, it was just a foreign concept. It was like, no, next thing, you know, like a yeah. robot. And now like, <laughs> I, I will find myself being like, kind of like what you said in this clip where, how, why am I going to alcohol to mm. celebrate, which yeah. is truly self-sabotage to your point of having the capacity because mm. it's like on a subconscious level, we're like, oh no, I'm not worthy of this. I can't mm. receive this. Let me go to alcohol and sabotage myself. Mm. And now I'm going to get back stuck again. Yeah, man. When you, when you notice that you're like, fuck, I am so much more brilliant than I ever give myself credit for, but also like, this is, this is the growth that nobody talks about, especially around success. And Gay Hendricks does a great job really like labeling this and defining this in his book, The Big Leap. And so I feel like a lot of it is probably just regurgitated from what I've read in that book um, years ago. But we all have a tolerance level of how much success, how much joy, how much happiness we can experience before that success, joy, and happiness actually becomes too vulnerable for us. It's too good. So we're waiting for the other proverbial shoe to drop. Like for the years of my life, Sam, I had such a small tolerance of how much joy that I can experience. And so I always forebode joy. I always downplayed it. Any experience, anytime things got too good, right? I would pick a fight in a relationship. I was self-sabotaged by making a decision I knew I shouldn't make because I needed my nervous system to come back to an experience that it felt familiar with, even though that experience it felt familiar with, it was yesterday's growth. And so in order for us to step into the next evolution of success and do it in a way where we can sustain it and we don't lose ourselves in the process, it has to happen from the inside out first. Meaning we have to teach our nervous system, right? So when I talk about capacity, like we all have a tolerance level of how much capacity or how much the capacity of how much joy, peace, love, success, finances that we can carry. Like we all have a tolerance level. 
And the reason what happens when we outstretch that tolerance level, we get to a point where our nervous system feels unsafe, right? It feels like, I remember when I first got into speaking, I hired this agency to do a little coach to do a little work with me and help me with my speaker demo reel. And he's like, Caleb, how much money do you want to make in a year? And of course I'm like 500,000 bucks, you know, like 500,000. And he's like, no, he's like, great. But he could tell that that number had no connection to me. It was just like this arbitrary number I was throwing out there to feel good about myself. He's like, I want you to really lean into like, what's the number that you feel comfortable making and then I want you to go a little bit over that to where that number feels unsafe. And I found a number where I'm like, that number does actually feel unsafe because if I make that money, that amount of money, that means there's more responsibility, right? There's risk of losing more. Like it's like you make a lot, but suddenly you realize how high you are and you see that far you could fall and then you could lose more. Your, your sense of attachment grows even stronger. Like there's a lot of risks and we don't really understand that. There's a lot of vulnerability that comes with that highest level of success, peace, love, and happiness. So we have these brilliant ways we call them uh, our loyal soldiers, these little soldiers that they don't know that the war is over. They're still fighting on our behalf to keep us safe. But the problem with keeping us safe is it keeps us stuck in yesterday's growth. And so part of this work is to really understand what our upper limits are when those loyal soldiers come online, right? Those loyal soldiers are the moments when you make the decision to go drink or you make the decision to pick a fight and self-sabotage, right? These are just self-protective parts of ourselves that are saying, hey, vulnerable, danger, danger, danger. Yeah. It's the thing you want the most, but it's fucking dangerous because we've never been there before. It's unfamiliar. Therefore it's very vulnerable. Let's dial it back a notch. So I'm going to come online. I got you, Caleb. I'm going to come online. I'm going to fuck shit up. And so that we can come back to this level where we're safe. Okay. Cause I just want you to survive. Part of growth is having the awareness being like, man, thank you. Self-protection parts Thank you, Mr. Loyal Soldier. Y'all have been so gracious to protect me, but we're okay. We're safe. I don't need you to deploy in the way that you once deployed in my life. We're moving on from here. And the way that we do that is we learn how to regulate our nervous systems in those moments of intense vulnerability, in those moments when we reach that threshold. And so for me, you know, I made... I, I, yeah, I made the most amount of money I've made in a day speaking um, through like had four calls and four keynotes. Full fee happened right there. You do and what you closed four keynotes. Four you closed four deliver. keynotes. Yeah, you didn't yeah. deliver four. Yeah, yeah, God. closed four keynotes. So it came out as like fifty six thousand bucks. Still mm-hmm. signed. Yeah, great. And I just was fucking ecstatic. I was like, oh yeah, I haven't done that. Like. I, I, it took me a whole year to make that. <laughs> like, and now I just close that in a day. And so I remember going upstairs and I sat down and I'm like, it's 457. I'm going to have a celebratory cocktail. And man, when I tell you, like, it was on autopilot, you know, that's what you do. Mm-hmm. And as I was getting up, I was just like, wait a minute. Why am I doing this? Yeah. Why am I going to poison myself to celebrate myself? And this isn't even about like, necessarily I, I love a good wine i love a good bourbon you know i don't ever have more than probably one drink now just because if i just feel it so much it feels like self-betrayal to me um but this was something of more along the lines of as you had mentioned like oh i am feeling vulnerable at this tier of success like mm-hmm. i just made more money but guess what that means more visibility More people are going to see me. More people are going to hear my message. I wasn't computing that at the time, but my nervous system understood that the path from here on out is very vulnerable. A lot of exposure. There's a lot to risk. We could lose it all. So they think. And so I realized that my work in that moment was to, we're safe, to show my nervous system in that moment that I am safe. We can do this. And what happened, Sam, is my nervous system just went from stress to stretch and my capacity and my tolerance level expanded. Now, suddenly my baseline for how much success and how much finance money that I can hold in my life in one moment just increased. We just Mm -hmm. grew. We up-leveled my life. And I am not shitting you when I tell you I had probably a little less than a month later, Sam, Mm -hmm. I had a $100,000 opportunity 
drop wow. in my lap. And it was the easiest work I've ever done in my life. Hmm. And I don't think there's any coincidence between that opportunity dropping in my lap and me learning how to increase my tolerance level to hold more financial success in my life. So if you could summarize this and <laughs> just a, a couple sentences, what the takeaway would be when you start to have that awareness of self-sabotage, are you saying to basically breathe into it, feel it and mm, let it pass through mm -hmm, and then transform mm -hmm. your beliefs? Don't hate yourself for self doubt. Like yeah. you have to reframe self-sabotage altogether. First off, you're self-sabotaging because your inner protectors, your loyal soldiers love you so much. It's an act of self-love. See it like that. You can't hate these parts away from you. Like you can't hate yourself into a life that you love. And so the acceptance of the self-sabotaging is first. I see you. I honor you. This once served me well, but I'm tired of repeating this pattern. And then it's, you know, I, for me, there's so many different ways that you could go about this, but what's the thought process that you're entertaining? How can you ground yourself if you're feeling intense in that moment, if you're feeling vulnerable, if you're feeling exposed, you know, whether you are in a heated conversation with a, a loved one or you like, you know, somebody just stormed out the door for the 15th time, then you're left feeling like what's next. And you feel that vulnerability. You feel that exposed sense of self. You feel the rawness of it. Just like, you know, give yourself a hug and breathe into it, ground yourself, really allow your nervous system to come back to the center and just be with that for a second before you make any other decisions. And it's not just, again, the next time you reach a new level of success in your life, be present with that. Just mm. you go have a drink, but before you have a drink, I want you just to be present. I want you to feel it. I want you to allow that feeling from the bottom of your feet, do a full body scan. Go from the bottom of your feet. I want you to feel that success in your toes, in your feet, in your calves, in your knees, in your legs, in your groin, in your belly, in your chest, in your neck, and in your head. I want you to just see it like a cup being filled with water. You're allowing that success just to permeate every fiber of your being. And then go have your drink and do it consciously. Yeah, intentional, even ceremonially yeah. for sure. And ceremonial, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Caleb. That is awesome. And, and if you're listening and that resonates with you, this is so much what my new book, Overcome the Overwhelm, is all about in the six-step breath Love. process to access inner peace. And it's interesting here you telling the story because I'm connecting the dots on things that I've known but kind of forgot about. But a few years ago, I was uh, I started my career transition in 2019, right before the lockdown. That was like around Fun. my big awakening. Yeah. And then... I was just like starting to get into fear over the next couple of years of being like, okay, my business is being crushed. I haven't figured out what's next. So then I end up selling my house in Silicon Valley. And what do you know, within two years, I lost all pretty much all of the money in selling my house in Silicon Valley. That's quite a, a chunk of change there. And what I realized was it was self-sabotage to your point. And I couldn't hold the capacity yeah. for that. So I had to be like, oh no, I can't have this bad investments, bad choices, mm. all of these things. So now like the six step breath process came as a result of that and other things last year, my life imploding and everything you said in there it resonates with me so deeply. And there are a few new takeaways for me as well. And good reminders too, like whether it's food or alcohol, like intentionally body mm -hmm. scan and be grateful. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, when I'm with my friends in spiritual communities and we gather together, you know, there's usually someone that will pray over the food. And that person is talking about all the different hands that go into it. And mm -hmm. when you really mm -hmm. think about all the different hands and everything that ha had to happen for this food to be right in front of you. And you truly feel gratitude. Mm -hmm. You'll feel that electrical mm. charge when you take a bite mm. into it, you know? That's beautiful. And, yeah. I, I want to be mindful of time. So, so much uh, here, so much more we could go into just real quick. If you could summarize the way you're helping people now with your keynotes, mm. like what's your main message and the takeaway that you're hoping people get out of your message? Yeah, I think my keynotes, um, I'm still trying to find a little more alignment. And I, when it comes to like what I really truly feel in my heart and also the message that I share on stage, um, I think with my keynote, 
my heartbeat really is, is, you know, the intersection of leadership and well-being. How do we create the capacity within ourselves to perform at our best, to thrive through the inevitable disruptions of our lives, but also have the capacity needed to love our lives? Right? How do we create the space to reclaim the life satisfaction and the joy that has been lost along the way as we have been surviving another day just to get by? Like right now, we're being invited to step into a new way forward, uh, more of a an approach that allows us to, again, thrive through it all, but also have the capacity to be present with the people that we love the most. Mm-hmm. And so it's just really speaking to the intersection of leadership and well-being, uh, sustainable success and performance, um, and also just life satisfaction and joy. Beautiful. Thank you again, Caleb. Thank you so much for sharing your story, your your tools and your inspiration. And I appreciate, you know, everyone that I come into contact with like you that is uh, leaning into these edges, no matter how uncomfortable it is, alchemizing it for yourself and mm. showing the way for others. So thank you, brother. Thanks, Sam. I appreciate you.